welcome to another tutorial video. This time around we're going to be looking at a very specific concept that is highly relevant whenever you're dealing with leverage buyouts or any other type of investment which is known as the waterfall distribution. And here's the concept. Normally when you buy a company, when a private equity firm buys a company, they'll end up owning close to 100% of it and they'll often give a small percentage of it to the management team because they want to incentivize them to perform. So maybe they'll give 2% or 3% or 5% or maybe they'll let the management team roll over the existing portion that they own and sometimes it just ends there. Sometimes that's it and that's the incentive they have to perform. But in other cases, depending on the performance of the investment, they will actually give the management team increased ownership and an increased percentage of the proceeds at the end when they go to sell the company. So here's a concrete example of what I mean using some very simple numbers. So let's say that in this case, the private equity firm has invested $1,000 of their own money to buy a company. Now at first, the management team owns 5%. So maybe they've rolled that over from existing ownership, or maybe they've contributed some of their own capital, whatever the case may be. And then at the very end of the investment period, after five years, we're assuming here, there are proceeds of $3,000. So they sell the company, they get back $3,000. So you can look at the numbers here and tell that it's a 3x return on their investment. So it's performed pretty well. We'll get into the exact numbers a little bit later on, but here's what it looks like at the outset. Now, if this were just the scenario wave here where this management team owned 5%, you know what it would be. Management would get 5% times the 3,000, and then the PE firm would get 95% times the 3,000 over here. So that's pretty straightforward. But what often ends up happening is that it might be something like this instead. So the management team might get 200 and the PE firm might get 2800 or the management team might get 300 and the PE firm might get 2700. And so that's what we're going to be looking at how to calculate these types of scenarios. Now, it doesn't have to be just the management team. If there are different types of investors, for example, you could also have that happen there. So if there is a lead private equity firm or lead investor, and then there are other investors, it might also happen with that. This is also very common in real estate. And we'll look at an example later on of a real estate model that has this type of logic built in. And usually what happens here, as I say in this example here, usually what happens is that this is based on the IRR of the deal. So Let's say, for example, that for an IRR up to 10%, the PE firm gets 95%, the management team gets 5%. Well, then what may happen is that once you go beyond that, so if the returns are beyond 10%, then for the portion between 10% and 15%, maybe the PE firm gets 90%, the management team gets 10%. And then at the next level, between 15% and 20%, Maybe the PE firm gets 85%, the management team gets 15%, and then maybe when you go above 20%, so almost double what the stock market has returned historically. Maybe the PE firm will get 80%, the management team will get 20% there. So these are actually very generous percentages, but I'm just using simple numbers here to illustrate the point. Now, you may ask yourself, why would a private equity firm want to do this? Why would any investment firm want to do this? Why would you voluntarily give up a portion of your stake in the proceeds? And the answer is that it may encourage the management team to perform even better and create a win-win scenario for everyone. So think about it like this. What if the management team only gets 5% and the overall IRR is 13%? So it just barely beats the long-term stock market average. That's one scenario. But then scenario number two, maybe we follow the schedule above where they get up to 20% depending on the returns and the IRR is more like 23%. So that's over 2x the long-term stock market average and... The other important point here is that with this scenario, everyone wins. So the PE firm has done better because the overall return is 23%, not 13%. And then the management team has also done better. So it's sort of a win-win scenario. Now, of course, it doesn't always happen like this in real life, which is one of the challenges, but that's the basic logic for doing this. Now, how do you model this type of scenario? Well, it can get very complicated, especially when you're dealing with something like real estate. But the basic steps, I'm going to outline right here, and then we're going to go through them step by step. First, you need to know the initial amount invested and how much comes back at the very end. So you determine these with your standard assumptions. You might set up a sensitivity for these amounts, but that's what you need in the beginning. We're going to assume no cash flows or dividends or anything like that in between because it would make it more complicated and it would be harder to illustrate the actual concept. You also need to know how much the management team versus the PE firm owns and how that changes at different levels of returns like we showed above in that simple example. And then what you have to do is for each of those levels, you have to figure out 
what amount of the net proceeds at the end corresponds to a 10% or a 15% or a 20% IRR. So for example, if you get returns of 2000, well, maybe if you run the numbers, you can see that up to 1600, that corresponds to a 15% IRR, and then up to 1850, that corresponds to a 20% IRR, whatever it is, you have to calculate that and figure out what it is at each level. Then you have to figure out how to split the proceeds within that tier. So in this example here, if the proceeds at the end are 3,000, 10% RR corresponds to 1611, then you distribute that 1611 between the PE firm and management team, and then the 3,000 minus the 1611 right here, that's what goes on to the next levels, and that's what you then have to distribute according to different percentages after that. Now, on the other hand, if you only have 1,500 left at the end, that's not even a 10% IRR. So in this case, it's actually very easy. You don't have to do anything. Once you've set this up, you're done. You just distribute that normally. And there really is nothing here. 1,500 minus 1,611 would actually be a negative number. So you don't do anything with that. And then the next step, as I was saying above, in the first example, you take that 3,000 minus the 1,611, and then you distribute that differently for the next level. In the second example, it's zero, and you can handle this with a maximum function in Excel. And then once you do that, you just keep going up each level beyond the first one, and you split the proceeds as necessary. So here's some of the Excel setup we're going to go through, and I'm going to show you step by step how to complete this process. Now, as I mentioned, this does get more complex. In real estate, for example, I have up here an office development model that we have, and you can look at some of the complexities in these formulas. Just take a look at these formulas to see how you have min, you have max, you have a lot of different things going on here. So it can definitely get more complex when you're contributing cash on a monthly basis, when you're maybe getting cash back on a monthly basis. But for now, we're just focused on the concept. So don't get too stressed out about these types of complex formulas because we're not really focusing on that in this lesson. So how do you start this? Well, the first thing that you do is you have these proceeds of 3,000. You want to figure out what amount corresponds to an IRR of 10%. So the first thing you do is take the initial amount invested up here, the 1,000. And remember what IRR means. It's effectively the compounded interest rate on an investment like this, especially when you have no cash flows or dividends or anything like that in between. So what do you do? Well, you take the previous number, and then you multiply by the IRR in this level. Now I'm going to anchor the D column part so that doesn't shift around. And then you can just copy this all the way across. And you can see that in this case, year five, if we get back 1611 in year five, that corresponds exactly to a 10% return. So the question is, how much in this level do we distribute and split with this 95% 5% split? And the answer to this is you distribute and split the 1611, and then you have the 3000 minus the 1611 here to, just to split in future levels. Now, you may look at this and think, okay, well, the formula is just 1611 right here, and that's all there is to it. However, there's a problem with that. And here's the problem. Let's say that we only have net proceeds of 1500 at the end. Well, now we're saying that we're distributing 1611, but actually we only have 1500 of proceeds to distribute. So what we have to do instead is compare these two numbers and take the lesser of them to set this up properly. So I'm going to say min between the I-99 and then the G-92, the net proceeds up here at the top. And then this way we can see that even when it goes down to very low levels, if we only get 100 back at the end, we only distribute 100 in this level. So that's how that works. And I'm going to change it back to 3,000 for now to illustrate this. And then we have an amount left to distribute here at the end. So you may look at this and think, okay, well, it's easy. You just take the net proceeds at the end, and then you subtract whatever amount corresponded to this IRR. And in some cases, this works. But again, same issue. What if this drops? And what if this only becomes 1,000? Well, now you end up with a negative here, which is obviously incorrect. You can't distribute a negative amount of return. So what you have to do instead is use a maximum function around this and say max between this and zero. So we have that. And then if we change it back to 3000, that still works. So that's the logic behind those formulas. Now, to, to figure out what amount goes to the PE firm versus the management team, you just take the 95% right here, and you multiply it by the amount that you're splitting up here. And then you do the same thing for the management team's percentage as well. So you have that. So this is what we do in the first level. And if we just stopped here, it really would be a 95% 5% split. But remember, we have clearly earned much more than a 10% return here. So we're going to go above and beyond this and see what happens in the next levels of the schedule. 
So now let's look at the 15% level. So what I'm going to do is actually just copy down all these formulas that we have above. And just so we have it for our reference, you can see how this is being linked to 15%, 1 plus 15% each year. And then let's copy these down again. And so we have that. We have it for all three levels now. So at the 15% level, we can see that 2011 at the end would correspond to 15% return. We have 3,000, so clearly we have earned more than a 15% return, which means that again, we have to distribute and split this amount, and then we'll have a certain amount of IRR left over to distribute at the end. So you may look at this at first glance and then say, okay, well, it's easy. You just take the 2011 here because we're in this range, and then you just subtract the 1611. That gets you the amount of proceeds that correspond to the 10% to 15% IRR range. But see, this is not quite correct because of the following reason. What if we had, say, 1,800 of proceeds here at the end? So it's in between these two levels. Well, we shouldn't be allowed to distribute 401 here. We should only be allowed to distribute the 1,800 minus the 1611. And so what we can do is use a minimum function and say we either take this one, this number, depending on whether it's smaller, or we take the net proceeds minus whatever we've distributed that corresponds to the 10% right here. So we have that. And then this is correct. So we get 189, 2000, and the 1800 minus 1611 is equal to the 189. But this is still not quite correct because of the following. What if we only get 1,000 back here at the end? Well, now we have a negative number here, which obviously we can never have. So one simple way to fix that would be to add a max function around this last part. And then this way, if we get a really negative return or something goes horribly wrong, we just end up with nothing, and that's correct. So it requires a little bit of thinking to get these min-max functions right, but it's well worth it because you can set it up once and then pretty much have it work as is. So we have that. And then for the amount of IRR left to distribute, basically you want to take the amount that was remaining at the previous level and then subtract whatever you distributed in this level. And you want to put a max function around this because you never want to end up in a case where this might be negative. So you add a max zero around this just to be safe. And then once again, you can calculate the amount that goes to the PE firm versus the management team right here. And I can actually just copy down what we have above to get this. So you that, and we can see that now in this level, the management team gets a lot more proportionally speaking, 10% rather than 5%. And of course, we'll see what the ultimate impact of this is at the end. Now, when you get down to level three, so this is the IRR through 20%. So now the PE firm is getting 85%. The management team is getting 15%. What about the formulas? In many ways, they're very similar. So what we can do here is use a similar min function, and we can take the amount of proceeds remaining at this level, and then we can subtract whatever was in the previous level. So that's the first part in the function that we had before. And then we're going to use a max function once again, and we're going to take the net proceeds at the top and then subtract however much we've distributed in the prior two levels. So the 401 right here, and then also in level one, the 1611. So again, same basic idea. We are either taking the total amount between the 2488 and the 2011, or we are taking the net proceeds minus however much we've distributed so far, and we're splitting that amount in this level. And once again, we're including max zero around it to prevent negatives. And then for the amount of IRR left to distribute, once again, we can just use a simple max function, take the amount from the previous level minus however much we've distributed here, and put a zero around that. And then once again, for these percentages, we can just copy and paste these formulas down. And so we have that. And then Next and last, really, so for the IRR above 20%, so at this level, we don't have anything else beyond that. Once you go above 20%, that's really it. And so in that sense, this is actually the easiest part because all you do is take the total remaining amount right here, the 512 from the previous level, and link to it, and the amount left to distribute, it's just zero because you have no other levels beyond this. And then this is the amount that the PE firm will get 80% of, and then the management team will get 20% of. So you have that. Now, what does all this mean? Well, to illustrate that, what I've done down here is I have a setup for the overall deal IRR and then the IRR only to the PE firm and then the IRR only to the management team. So what happens? Well, the overall deal IRR, everyone together put in a thousand and then everyone at the end gets back 3000. So the IRR here, if you run the function in Excel is about 25%. Now here's the question for you. What is the IRR to the PE firm here? And you can probably figure out that it's going to be less than the 25% question is how much less and how do you actually calculate it? You calculate it by going up and taking the amount that goes to the PE firm in each level 
and doing that all the way up to the top. And then let's see what the IRR is here. So let's just take this for the whole area. 23.3%, so it's about 1.3% less. What about the management team? So here's the interesting part. Let's go up and do the same thing. Let's add in the management team proceeds at each level. So we have those four levels, we have that. And then what is the IRR here? 42.6%, so it's almost double the IRR of the PE firm. And this is the magic of management promotes and these waterfall distributions. So the end result, as you can see right here, in most cases, the IRR to the PE firm is gonna be less than the overall deal's IRR, but it's much greater for the management team as their percent of ownership increases. And really that's because the PE firm owns 95% at the beginning, so giving away a percentage of the company makes less of an impact. It's great for the management team because they own so little in the beginning to start with. PE firm is not really affected by giving away a fair chunk of the proceeds as you move up because they already own 95% of the company. And so this is a this is why it's a very powerful way to incentivize management teams because the PE firm or the investors are not really giving up that much and yet the management team is getting a lot of benefit out of this. Now, to show you what happens at some other levels here, I'm going to go and change around some of the numbers. So let's say that it doesn't do as well. So let's say that the net proceeds at the end are 2100 instead. What happens here is that the IRR gets distributed through some of these levels, but not through everything. So the IRR here is less than 20%. And you can see here it's 16%. To the PE firm, it's 15.7%. To the management team, though, it's 21.8%. So look at that. Even when the deal doesn't do as well, the management team still ends up benefiting a whole lot more and getting a really good return, whereas the PE firm does not do as well. Now, what happens if it really crashes? Let's say they only get back a thousand. They only make back their money at the end of five years. So in this case, they've only made back their money. What would the IRR be here? But 0% for everyone. The fact that there is a management promote and that the management team gets more ownership at different return percentages just doesn't make a difference here. That also applies if you don't even get up to a 10% return. So let's say that they get back 1,200 at the end. In this case, take a look at this. The returns are 3.7% to everyone. And so until you hit that 10%, it doesn't start changing and it doesn't start differing between different classes of investors in this deal. So that is how the waterfall schedule works. And just to recap what we went through here, it's really what I said. You can see how this works. That it's an easy way to incentivize management teams because it makes very little impact on the PE firm. In downside cases, there's no real impact at all. In upside cases, yes, they give up a little bit, but the management team is really incentivized to perform well. And the way you set it up, as we just went through, you need to know the initial amount invested, how much comes back at the end, the percentages at each level. You take the initial investment and see what amount of proceeds would correspond to a 10%, 15%, 20% IRR, distribute the proceeds within that tier, figure out how much is left over for the next tier, and then as you keep going up through each tier, keep calculating the distribution and seeing how much is left over. So that's it for the waterfall schedule. Comes up all the time with leverage buyouts, also very frequently in real estate investments, and now you should know something about how this works and what the rationale for this is.